Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this podcast, we hear from Professor Katrina Pennell about the United Kingdom in 1914. My name is Professor Katrina Pennell. I'm a historian at the University of Exeter. I specialise in late 19th and early 20th century British and Irish history with a particular interest in the social and cultural history of the First World War. I'm here in St Andrews participating in the British Home Front Conference, which is exploring the way the British state, economy, society, culture mobilised for the conflict and sustained the First World War for four and a half years. The state that went to war on the 4th of August 1914 was the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. Ireland was part of the state of Britain. Britain, of course, was made up of England, Scotland and Wales. There was a sense of a British national culture, but Ireland was divided over issues surrounding home rule, the move towards having its own parliament in Dublin. And this concerned the British public greatly to the extent that what's going on in Europe in July 1914 pales in comparison to what many British people think is civil war erupting across the Irish Sea. The Liberal government that had been in power since 1906 faced a number of serious political challenges in the years preceding the outbreak of the First World War. The Labour Party, which had come into creation in 1900, by this stage was a significant political force backed by the trade union movement. There had been a number of serious clashes, particularly in the years 1912 to 1913, between union members, strikers, police and troops. So organised labour was becoming a very important feature of British political life. And the Liberal Party, much like the Conservative Party, remained a relatively rigid, patriarchal, hierarchical structure that was struggling with how to deal with the issue of organised labour. Another major challenge was the suffragette movement. For many Edwardian men, the threat of militant women was a much scarier prospect than organised labour. There were various factions of the suffragette movement, the WSPU, the Women's Suffrage Political Union, led by the Pankhursts, was the more militant. By 1914, the government was really struggling with how to deal with this issue. Perhaps the most famous act being the so-called Cat and Mouse Act, where women who had been incarcerated and then went on hunger strike were released until they could become medically fit again and then they were re-imprisoned. So there was this real tension between government and women who were calling for increased representation. The most serious threat faced by the Liberal government in the years preceding the outbreak of war came from Ireland. Ireland had been grappling with the issue of home rule for many years but this was really reaching a peak by 1914. Irish nationalists were calling for increased independence from the British state. They weren't advocating necessarily for total independence, or certainly what constitutional nationalists like John Redmond were calling for was a kind of dominion status, that they remained in association with Britain and the British crown, the British state, but they had their own parliament in Dublin. Now, this was an abhorrent idea to the Unionists, led by James Craig and Edward Carson, the Protestant minority, who felt that this was a threat to their identity as members of the United Kingdom. So the Unionists start mobilising against what they fear is home rule being passed through Parliament. They raise a private army, the Ulster Volunteer Force, and start engaging in illegal gun importation. The Irish nationalists respond to this by raising their own private army and again importing guns. This comes to a head on the 26th of July 1914, which of course is right bang in the middle of the July crisis to do with the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. And the king's own Scottish borderers, so British soldiers, fire on a group of Irish civilians in Dublin on Bachelor's Walk. 
They suspect them of being Irish nationalist gun runners. Four people are killed. There is absolute pandemonium. It is reported back in Britain under really frightening headlines like slaughter in Ireland and conflict in Dublin. King George V goes as far to say, and I'm paraphrasing here, civil war is on the lips of the most sober minded of my people. It's a really, really frightening time. For the vast majority of people living in Britain at this time, it is not the European crisis that is terrifying them. It is the prospect of civil war in Ireland. So that was the state of British politics in the years leading up to 1914 and the outbreak of war. But we need to think about what the British economy looked like. There are two main schools of thought on Britain's economic position in the years 1870 to 1914. There is an argument that suggests that Britain's economic power is waning, that it for too long has focused on traditional products such as coal, steel, iron, cotton, that these are old trades, that Britain's economy is outdated. It's not adapting fast enough. It isn't investing enough in innovation, entrepreneurs, new products like vehicles, chemicals and electrical engineering. These concerns are exacerbated by the rise of other industrialised nations. Britain was one of the first countries to industrialise. That brings its own benefits. But if you're the first to industrialise, others can learn from your mistakes. Germany and America in particular are rising as new economic powers. We can't take the economic decline argument too far. Yes, America and Germany are catching up with Britain. But Britain in 1913 still is the most productive economy amongst the industrialised nations of Europe. Growth is naturally going to be faster in places that are undergoing industrial transformation after Britain because they can learn from Britain's experience. The argument that Britain isn't being innovative enough in economic terms can be challenged by the fact that there is a great deal of innovation taking place in commerce and finance. The City of London, which is the centre of global economic affairs, is the trading house of all aspects of international trade. The other important thing is the debate around tariff reform. There is a move, particularly amongst individuals like Joseph Chamberlain, to try and regulate the British economy and protect British trade through tariff reform. He envisages this through the creation of an imperial federation. Free trade is understood to be the best way to conduct economic affairs in Britain. It speaks to Victorian values of laissez-faire. It shows the distaste for state intervention into economic affairs. And that's something that has to change in order for the economy to be mobilised for a global conflict. With economic change such as industrialisation, there comes major societal transformation. The most notable change in British society prior to the outbreak of the First World War is the increase in town dwellers. This isn't the same across all regions. Ireland remains a very agricultural area. But on the whole, what we're seeing is Britain becoming a nation of town dwellers. This brings with it its own complications, not least issues around housing, sanitation, poverty, unemployment. Housing is a particularly prominent issue. It was deficient in both quantity and quality. It was not unusual for large numbers of people, families to be living in one room. Alongside these concerns, there were also fears raised by the South African War, which had been fought between 1899 to 1902. It was a very difficult conflict for the British. They believed they were fighting a band of irregular guerrillas, and it actually turned out to be a lot harder than anyone ever anticipated. Part of the concerns around that was the number of British men that had been declined entry into the armed services because of physical ill health. And there was a great deal of debate around how the state could step in to support those that were unable to support themselves. Up until this point, poverty, unemployment, those who needed help in society had been left to private charities and, in the worst case, the poor law. The poor law was an important safety net But the charity that was given through it was done so grudgingly and so minimally that it was really only the most desperate that fell into it. 
1912, 780,000 people in England and Wales were given relief by the poor law and in Scotland some 109,000. One of the main concerns of the Liberal government in this period was how best to support the population, particularly those that were unable to support themselves. What you see happening is an increasing interest in citizen entitlement, in the state having to step in to ensure everyone is on a level playing field, or that's the aspiration. You can see this appearing in all sorts of different areas. The 1870 Education Act, the Public Health Act, the Pensions Act, unemployment insurance, all of these areas where the state is trying to make official the provision available to its citizens. This is connected to the representation of the People Act 1884, which had increased the size of the electorate considerably. It included all men paying rent up to £10 and those holding land valued at £10. But it did not introduce universal suffrage. Around 40% of adult males were excluded from the vote and, of course, famously, all women were. What you're seeing happening is a sense of the state taking on more responsibility for its citizens because an increasing number of its citizens are in a position to start demanding those sorts of entitlements. One of the most important ramifications of the 1870 Education Act was the increase in literacy. By 1914, 99% of the British population, men and women, were literate. This helps us to understand the significance of the press in the years preceding the outbreak of war. The British press in 1914 consisted of a really vibrant array of metropolitan, provincial and specialist newspapers and magazines. These ranged from establishment newspapers like The Times to newer cheaper, more popular titles like the Daily Mail, the Daily Express and the Daily Mirror. Lord Northcliffe, who owned the Times and the Daily Mail, Lord Beaverbrook, who owned the Daily Express, had a very close relationship with politicians because politicians understood that the press was an important vehicle through which they could place stories in order to gauge public opinion or that they could use the press to expose an issue to the public. So what you see happening in this period is a relationship between politicians and the press which is perhaps less critical than what you see today. The United Kingdom in 1914 was part of a world empire and a global economic system. I would describe it as a very outward-looking collection of nations. You can see evidence of this in increasing travel, trade, migration. Around 6 million British people emigrated, mainly to Canada and Australasia between 1870 and 1911. You compare that to the number of people coming into the country, and it's a lot less. The vast majority of foreigners entering Britain in that period are Irish. It's around 1 million Irish people and around 400,000 Jews from Eastern Europe. When we think about what it means to be British or perhaps more specifically English at this time, there are all sorts of descriptors we could use, superior, a sense of self-satisfaction, an awareness of Britain being a bastion of progress and democracy, as well as elements of militarism and jingoism, pride in one's empire, pride in the monarchy. Empire Day was invented during this period. It was a tradition adopted in 1902. It's been dismissed by some historians as unpopular, un-British, but it's also been highlighted by others as a celebration that really underscored a sense of racial superiority and righteousness of the British Empire in this pre-conflict period. But much like the economy, there were also concerns that Britain's international position was in a period of decline. A nice way of understanding this is by looking at Rudyard Kipling's poem Recessional, which was published on the front page of The Times on the 17th of July, 1897. This was a poem that was part of the celebrations of Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. But what it does is provide a warning of the very transient nature of British imperial power. There was a real fear that Britain's imperial position was declining not least because a number of the white dominions were now moving towards independence. Added to that, the difficulties that Britain faced in the South African War 
created a sense of disaster narrowly averted. There were concerns over Britain's manpower, that they just weren't physically up to the job, about how rapidly Britain would be able to put together an army that would be able to fight on land. There was a great deal of investment in the Royal Navy at this time. In fact, many people believed that as an island nation, Britain would be best defended by a navy. This fed into debates about conscription. The National Service League was established by certain prominent conservative figures like Lord Roberts, who advocated that Britain's defence needs would be best met by conscription. France and Germany already had conscripted armies. The National Service League did gain membership of around 200,000 people, but it was quite restricted to certain sections of society, particularly the lower and upper middle classes. On the whole, conscription was not a popular idea. Yes, this was a period of time where the British public were very interested in stories of empire, the boys' own adventures, those kind of things. Many people participated in what could be described as military elements of British society, such as the volunteer movement or the newly created officer training corps that was attached to universities. But there is an argument that this isn't evidence necessarily of a militaristic society, but instead a sense of Victorian and Edwardian Britain having more recreational time to fill. So whilst we might understand things like participation in rifle shooting contests or military reviews as evidence of militarism, actually we can think of it as more evidence of Britain's interest in spectator sports and an attempt to regulate working class communities and improve physical condition through those types of activities. Militarism had its limits in pre-war Britain. First of all, conscription was not introduced. It never gained the popular ground that was needed to introduce it as a policy. You've got intellectuals and writers such as Norman Angel, who argued that militarism and the expansion of the military would have a detrimental effect on Britain's interests, not least because going to war would be a really irrational act that would put into jeopardy international trade links and a system of economic markets that Britain was reliant on. Added to this, like many Europeans, British people believed that they were part of a civilization of the likes the world had never seen. And a key feature of that was a civilized society turned away from war. This needs to be set within a context of international affairs not least the Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907, along with the Geneva Conventions. These were some of the first formal statements of the laws of war and war crimes that were essentially trying to say that war should be avoided by Pacific settlement, and if war did break out, it needed to be regulated to protect the innocent. So the United Kingdom on the eve of the First World War faced a number of serious challenges. Politically, it was very divided, facing threats from Labour, from the suffragette movement, and most seriously from Ireland. This is even before we factor in what in hindsight became known as the July crisis. So perhaps what is of most interest in this context is less the diplomatic reasoning of why Britain ended up entering the First World War, but how a country apparently so divided was able to unite in August 1914 and produce very quickly a sense of unification around the national cause. That was Professor Katrina Pennell on the United Kingdom in 1914. You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorne and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. In our next podcast, Michael St. Moore Scheel talks about his exhibition of photographs of First World War battlefields today, Fields of Battle, Lands of Peace.